Hi everybody, welcome to episode 40 of the Alexis L podcast. Uh, this is particularly uh, germane to events that have been unfolding uh, last week. And this week, uh, a little while ago, uh, somebody called AJ from Palestine Action, uh, a group who uh, I've always supported, uh, got in touch and, uh, you know, suggested themselves for a, a podcast. Mm -hmm. And um, it seems particularly relevant, so we've kind of, uh, uh, you know, we've we've actioned this yeah. podcast <laughs> rapidly, and uh, this is it. And I think it is as I think the the media narrative around the um, situation in Gaza has been the mainstream media has been disgusting beyond belief. Really, mm -hmm. uh, has been breathtakingly one-sided with a with a few noble exceptions such as uh, you know Nevada media and also Owen Jones I think has been amazing yeah um and uh, in our own small way maybe we can uh, we can add a bit of uh, clarity to the uh, just the disgraceful uh, one-sided just brain story that is being told you want to say something? It's marketing, isn't it? It's, it's also just very good <laughs> marketing on Israelis' behalf. For what it is. Well, that's true. I, I, want, I want to give props to Double Down News as well, as always, as well. Yeah, um, they've for been their good. for their reporting. And I just wanted to point out before we dive into it, I wanted to draw a thread between this and our last episode with Richard Parry, um, which was you know there's an anarchic thread because AJ talks yeah. a lot about her roots in anarchy. Mm -hmm. Uh, and also in the last episode, I think it was discussed how there isn't space for young people to talk about left-wing politics and, and anarchy and communism and, and all yeah. this stuff. And, and I think AJ, again, proved that there are young people out there getting involved. I think it's so inspiring, yeah. Um, and yeah, she was great. It was really, yeah. really a good chat. All right, let's get to it. So AJ, you're from Palestine Action, and uh, tell us well, tell us everything about yourself, but specifically <laughs> your actions, I suppose. Uh, yes. Yeah, so um, I'll just talk a little bit about what Palestine Action is at first for yeah. those who, who don't know. And I, I, I have been meaning to. You must send me. I've been mean. I don't think I have sent you any money yet, but I am meaning to. So <laughs> oh, I don't will worry. do well, after this. No, I've I think it's. Uh, I've got. I've got Talal's number, so you know I can always send people <laughs> after him. Like just, to, right. and he, he can send them forwards onto you. Uh, no, Fair so <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you know, uh, Palestine Action is a direct action network, which you know means essentially that we're not a membership organization. We're not the sort of group that you join uh, by, you know buying a membership or, or or coming to a local meeting or whatever it's you 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 part of Palestine action if you've done an action uh what 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 we do is is less campaigning and more like campaigning in, in the military sense yeah. you know we actually uh get together uh in, it's a bit like being in a gang in it like in LA you yeah, get jumped well, in I wouldn't say that because you know they're trying to they're trying to yes, get I'm us sorry, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're trying to get us marked as a gang before but uh no no it's so it's 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 not not that cool it's just a lot of you know having to use annoying apps instead of being able to text people because you've probably got spies looking right. at you uh, but all's your, all's it really is, is meeting up with like a few other people enough to do whatever action it is you think you, you might want to be, be up for and then getting together and do it. We focus on, uh, arms factories, uh, the, um, the, uh, Israeli occupying forces, mm -hmm. uh, especially those of Elbert systems, mm -hmm. uh, which is Israel's largest arms company. Uh, they supply over eighty-five percent of the drones, and a lot of those drones get built here in Britain and shipped out. Mm -hmm. uh, which you know, a lot of people don't realise that the all these murders that you're seeing happen on on the television, on the news, when it on the rare circumstances that they decide to show it, you know, yeah. that's that's not disconnected from our communities. That's the the weapons that are doing the killing there are being built here. Yeah, 
It's also just to show how diverse my life is. A few months ago, I was actually having a, a dinner with a, a British Army helicopter pilot, and uh, he was just, you know, I don't think I'm aware of my where my sympathies lie. We're just talking about all the great kit, Israeli kit, that is in their their machines of death, really. So they've insinuated themselves into the into the wider arms industry as well, really. But, uh... Yeah, yeah. So so uh, speaking for myself personally, I, I took action, I took an accountable action, uh, which is an action where you know you, you know that what you're doing is going to get you arrested, mm -hmm. uh, but that's part of the strategy because uh, legally speaking, the action is actually supported by law. Uh, but of course, the people who enforce those laws don't care about that. They care more mm. about criminalizing you and stopping you from getting in the way of their business. Uh, so the action I took was on a, a engine factory in Shenston in the Midlands called UAV Engines, which is one of Elbert's uh, UK subsidiaries. And they make the engines that go into the Hermes drones, both the Hermes 450, Hermes 900, uh, and we know from export licenses that they're the only company here that can build and export those uh, those engines. We know they do, as much as they deny it. Mm, uh, yeah. th that's the most important part of the drone, in the words of Elbert's executives. It's the only part of the drone that's not redundant. But, but also, Elbert has a variant of their Hermes drones that they sell to the British military and, and call watchkeepers. Mm -hmm. uh, so... Like when I broke into the factory and smashed some of those drone engines, uh, the even though we know that they're going to Israel and they're being used by the IOF, mm. the signage on the door says "Watchkeeper." You know, right. like and when people in the arms industry being dishonest, who would ever? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Who would ever think and, that that if you're you're making shit that kills people, that you're not going to be straight about you know what yeah, you're doing. And, 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 you know, that's all part of the posturing is like when actions go against them, they then, uh, after my action in particular, they sent out a newsletter to the local organizations, basically calling us liars and, and talking mm, about how they, yeah. how they only uh, serve the British military and how they just want to support our boys, you know, all, yeah, all, that, right. all that rah, rah, like yeah. middle class conservative bollocks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know how, I don't know how you square it really with um like square it with yourself you know doing what they do really making and you know, making that i i've always it's like you can't it's um is it psychopathy weird. psychopathy like it's it's no, i don't know what it is really i don't know how people i mean human beings are very good I at lying it's, to yeah, themselves it's, I think. it's that they receive enough validation and normalization by like the systems that they're interested right. in i, I mm. think like because no matter how much criticism they have to face like in their job where they've got to go every day to eat like they yeah. get told this is what we're doing this is a good thing that we're doing right you know, in, inside the walls of those factories as much as they uh deny shipping off to israel and stuff like that all yeah. the, the walls of their factories are covered in like sexy sleek like drone shots of them flying above the clouds next to posters talking about all the different places they've exported to and things right. like and like showing graphs and things you know it's like it's you get some... multiple levels of of uh, indoctrination and and, right. and and propaganda just on the in the factory like yeah. in the actual factory itself yeah, uh, yeah. as well as obviously the day-to-day -day culture of like of how people act uh yeah. you know they pretend they're not an israeli company uh they pretend they're british owned and only employ british people and and like that's the only thing that matters is that they employ british people but like at the end of the day yeah, they're a, jobs. They're a, they're an jobs, arm of jobs, the, jobs. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're an arm of the Israeli military. I'm sure. Like before that, before that uh, factory supplied drone engines, it supplied engines for motorbikes. Why aren't we still making British yeah. motorbikes? And, and yeah. if if we if we care that much about jobs, why do the jobs have to kill people? Like, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Well, I always I always say that was. Uh, um, I remember really up, uh, when I used to get invited on these fucking those stupid shows. There was one Andrew Neil used to do one late at night where it wasn't any more than some time when Michael Portillo and Diane Abbott would sit uncomfortably <laughs> close on the couch. I don't remember that, <laughs> but I remember saying really upsetting Michael Portillo by saying that Margaret Thatcher really refocused British industry to only two things. Really, one was banking, 
where you know this is essentially stealing your money or finance. And the other one was the arms industry. It was, you know, like mm. British Aerospace, for instance, you used to make mm. passenger jets. Focused solely on shit that kills people, reorientated towards that. I remember Michael Portillo getting very upset about that. I mean, that, that's essentially what, like, and it the, disgraces our country. I think, anyway. Sorry, yeah, go on. Oh no, sorry. No, I mean, you're absolutely right. It is. It's a fucking disgrace. But yeah. like, it, like that's 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 what neoliberalism is. You know, that's what the project with uh, Thatcher and Reagan was. You yeah. know, you could see it being built up in the years before them. It comes out of fighting the uh, the decolonial struggles. Uh, but basically, what they've done is they incorporated into typical liberal po- uh, parliamentary politics, like the economic and military policies of fascism and yes. of of the colony of like the colonial system and yes. they just they made that business as usual so that they could get away with it in, in, in like in out in the open basically and that, that's yeah. that's what the whole project was and that's the project that we're trying to kill yeah that's very much where we are now i mean tell i mean tell us a little bit about what a drone actually does I mean, one of these uevs you E U A, where they got on it. Yeah, it? so it, it's it stands for UAV. I like to get the jargon right. UAV. Yeah, it's it's an unmanned aerial vehicle. Unmanned aerial uh, vehicle. Thank you. But uh, yeah, so basically, they're often used uh, for surveillance. Um, you know, like almost almost every time you see people being killed from a drone, you see it from like the camera angle of the of the of the drone, like the, those mm. POV shots. Yeah. Well they've also just got those cameras like at all times. So right. as as well as being armed, they're also used for surveillance. Uh uh Elbert, who is the company who produces the drones, also uh manages the apartheid walls. Uh and like like they they also do or most of like Elbert's cyber most of Israel's cyber secu- cyber security stuff, mm-hmm. um, and you know by developing these technologies on surveilling Palestinians and on surveilling resistance on finding out if there's any gay people in the community so they can blackmail them to be spies against yes. other people in the community you know or all, yes. all that from developing these methods. Uh, they then don't just like make extra money by teaching those methods to our governments and our police forces, which which they yes. do. But they also uh, basically then subcontract themselves out as providing the software, uh, providing. Uh, well, in in the case of the US, you know, they, they got the contract to build Trump's border wall against Mexico, uh, based on them building the but apartheid they use it wall. As a, yeah, they use it as a laboratory, don't they? Say, look, yeah. what, it's battle tested. That's what. Yeah, they yeah. They, 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 mar- they literally market their weapons as being yeah. battle tested because yeah. of how they're used, as we see right now, on the captive Gazan population. Yeah, uh, and and and. It, it's all just marketing. It's all the systems of oppression recommodifying themselves and just like concentrating in that way. Those yeah. video shots of buildings falling down are just fucking adverts for their for their bombs. Yeah, for their shit. R- really, legitimately. I mean, if you if you oh. there was a thing. Obviously, you can see, you know, like the US specifically, how they help spread the Zionist propaganda. You know, Joe Biden himself was repeating those blood libelous claims about babies being beheaded and things yes. like that. Uh, only for then, the, and saying he'd seen photographs of it, only yeah, for like yeah. the White House themselves to have to be like, that didn't happen. There was no photographs. Yeah. He just yeah. made that up. You know, like, yeah. they, they'll say He's whatever confused. they want. Granddad's confused. Yeah. But yeah. like, but the at the end of the day, it's 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 because it's and I think they actually also recently had a memo uh, get leaked that talked about how they don't want any politicians calling for an end to the violence. They don't want any politicians calling for a calm and for any like humanitarian concern. There was all words that they were like not allowed to call for. That was this basically. Is- just to st- like no, US. we have to we have to encourage. I think this is the US. Right. Uh, we have to encourage uh, this sort. We have to encourage calls for violence. We have to encourage this revenge like yeah. Uh, yeah. impulse. We ha- we have to like. Mean meanwhile, Israel are, are, are blatantly saying these are human animals. We have to treat yeah. them like animals. Yeah. And uh, they're fucking run- putting adverts out. Israel are putting adverts out on YouTube and Twitter. Yeah, they're, I got one. Did you see I, I the- wish there was a way you could 
Can you email back to an advert saying, fuck you? <laughs> I wish, man. Yeah. Uh, I, I, and, uh, yeah, you'll see a tweet about all the deaths that happened in, in Israel in their 9-11, which they're calling it. Uh, yeah, we all know what 9-11 a- led to as well. And then mm-hmm. you'll see in the corner, it says ad. And, like, mm-hmm. it was just an official tweet by Israel saying, you know, 1,200 dead, uh, you know, 200 children, all that, all the stats. And it's a fucking paid advert. To, yeah, and it and does. It beggars belief that they're they're literally marketing this. They're using it as a branding opportunity. It's crazy. Absolutely, and but I suppose which leads us to tell us about your own personal kind of. Uh, I find myself saying journey much more often than I, <laughs> you I say like that way really, too much. But right? how you came to, <laughs> you know, not yeah, you know, join the. What are you saying? Oh, the uh, the, no, ne- we'll the network. Till I was muttering. Oh, oh no! <laughs> so, yeah, you, you you say journey a lot. Yeah, I've not, I know. Uh, I say journey <laughs> a lot. I wish I didn't. I wish there was another way. But Listen, uh, as as a, as a trans woman, I'm used to hearing people say journey a lot. No, really, <laughs> yes, you would be. <laughs> Don't worry yeah. about it. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, rather than like join, you know, the young fucking Labour Party or some shit like that, what took <laughs> you to? What led you to, um, you know, actually put your, your, you know, something I admire, by the way, tremendously, you, you know, put your um, your life, in a sense, your freedom on the line for this, for the court, for other people, you know? Thank you. Well, uh, you know, I'm just one of hundreds of people. Uh, at this point, literally hundreds of people have, have been arrested for Palestine action. Mm-hmm. Uh, in, in terms of my own, like, personal political journey, I, you know, I grew up in a family that was very much like working class. We only ever vote Labour or whatever, but I was disillusioned before I got the chance to vote Labour. Uh, you know, I think the the first election like sort of mainstream politics thing that I was conscious for was the one that uh, resulted in, you know, the big hung parliament uh, with the Tories and the Lib Dems. 2010. 2010, yeah. And, you know, at that time I was, you know, my understanding of politics was all from like school and the newspaper. So very like liberalized version of what things should be. It was like, oh, well, According to I'm looking at I'm looking at the uh, I'm looking at the manifestos and actually the Lib Dems have got the best policies you know like that's <laughs> me 13 years old you know like <laughs> but but you know obviously ah, like sweet as, the naivety yeah, yeah. Yeah, I remember but those. then obviously as yeah. soon as like anything actually unfolds before me while I'm paying attention to it I just got like yeah. oh this is all bollocks isn't it yeah. actually so then I, I started identifying as an anarchist from like 13 uh, right. but you know obviously. I wasn't connected in any way really to like much anarchist organizing. So like I almost feel bad in retrospect saying I was an anarchist because I wasn't an active anarchist, you know, like I did I did some I did some food not bomb stuff. I did like I tried to do some self-ed stuff, but but at the time they were uh they didn't know as much what to do with people who were like on benefits and didn't actually have a job. Uh after I after I like stopped organizing with them the after that like did seem to pivot to like uh organizing around job centers and like you know right. doing like sort of like a people's claimant union sort of thing uh but when i was there they were all they were just sort of like oh well we don't really know what to do with yet if you if you're disabled and you and you can't work you know like uh <laughs> uh but oh, yeah so cute. yeah <laughs> uh you know so like i but, I ended up going, uh, like, I nearly got pulled into the RCG through, like, a climate front group that they had. Uh, but then That's as soon the revolutionary as... communist group. Yeah. yeah. And they're, they're, like, hardline. What are they? Uh, I think that, you know, like, the probably someone would have once called them a trot, but they wouldn't like oh, it right. if you called them trots, you know, like, right, that sort right, of thing. Right, okay. uh, but, you know, to me, like, I, I, I found them because they had a poster on the street for, like, uh, an internationalist film festival they were doing, uh, which you know a lot of it focused on Palestine on the first mm-hmm. day, but I, I missed that day. And the second day was a lot more about like imperialism in South America, and right. I got drew in through that because you know it gave me a lot of uh, like actual detailed understanding of like the concepts that I knew, like that I knew in theory were happening in the world. I knew there was this like sort of colonial oppression capitalist oppression like i knew it was happening in theory but then they were able to actually say like 
look at this, look at what's happening in Bolivia, look at like, here's the numbers, here's the corporate concerns, here's like how this is blatantly a coup being organized by the US. You know, it very much materialized a lot of things for me and like brought imperialism to the front of like what I was focusing on. So this was, this where was, where where did this like physically take place? So this was in Liverpool still. This is when I was, I I don't live in Liverpool at the minute, but I, I was then. Uh, so th- this meeting was just in like in somewhere in town. I don't remember. I think I saw right. the, I saw the poster on Bold Street. Right. Uh, but uh, yeah, no. But so like I I ended up joining like this climate group Earth Strike, which was like an anti imperialist, anti capitalist climate group. But it was really just a front group for the RCG, to be honest. <laughs> uh, like to try and funnel people in. Right, uh, yeah. And you know, it's it was the sort of thing that probably put me on the path towards like a more direct action focused thing uh because you know they would they would they would they would sell papers in the street like any fucking communists but they would also yeah. <laughs> but they would also I like they were, plan- well. they, they were planning you know like bank occupations and things like that right. and it was like very low level stuff com- compared to what we're fo- i'm focusing on these days but at yeah. the time to me it was like wow you're doing more than a march like you're actually trying to like stop business for a bit you know that seems like it's getting something done mm-hmm. in retrospect it was still very much just gestural politics yeah but like but at the time it was an impressive gesture to me sure. uh then so then they tried to funnel me into like actually joining the rcg i did some research and found out about you know like their own like rape cover-up scandals and things that they've had <laughs> like a lot of the communist groups in this country yes. uh so i said uh, yeah. yeah. So, so I, you know, I yeah. said to the people I'd been organizing with, like, hey, I'm not saying it's anything against you. I know you are doing good work, but I can't join a group where, like, I know where this is, like, what's going on. At which yeah. point, they immediately closed the wagons and were like, yeah, and you know, I can't believe you, you would put around these vicious rumors about us. You know, that's yeah. sort of classic, like, cult, cult behavior. behavior. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Rather than address the problem and try and weed it out, they just yeah, yeah, put up these. So, walls. Th- so then, what happened? <laughs> uh so yeah from from there i was you know i was basically uh i tried to, i was i kept like trying to find something political that i could believe in and like i guess like slow like i, I got drawn during politics into acorn uh because they were doing a lot of actions against What's that? uh Acorn's a, a, a community union, like a tenancy union, primarily, but but they do other they do other forms of organizing as well. Um, but yeah, so like I think it started in America. It, it came here like a while a while ago, and it, it builds up like it's got like strongholds in Bristol and stuff. But uh, yeah, I got attracted into it because during the pandemic, you know, they were doing actions like demos against landlords and uh, and things like that to like try and. Uh, put pressure on people's landlords for them to give them more negotiating power they were getting you know good they were getting like compensation for people they were getting uh better terms for people all sorts of things like that so i saw that, like oh this is actually changing like people in the community's lives let me join on with this uh but then you know with any like sort of those sorts of political organizations you find out eventually that like Oh, actually, there's been there's already been a split before you've joined. <laughs> you know, there's all sorts of drama that's gone on that you don't know about. Yeah. Uh, it turns out that like Central have done all sorts of union busting with the staff. You know, like also <sighs> like just horrible labor politics within yeah. these like supposed like union structures. Uh, yeah, but then the next thing I ended up doing was Palestine Action. Uh, I think I first. I, I first I first tried to sign up like as soon as I heard about them really because uh, I was just like oh it does stuff as soon as I knew that there was an option of like oh there's Israeli war manufacturing going on in this country in our communities twenty minutes up the road or whatever I can't not try and go and stop that so I tried to sign up but then you know the first time I tried to sign up I didn't hear anything back uh, just because you know there's a lot of a lot of things happen in organizing. There's a lot of reasons why uh, someone wouldn't get get, get back to it. Uh, mm-hmm. But then, then I think, I think in May, it was May twenty May May twenty twenty. It was 
it wasn't, you know, like the scale of the May 21 bombings, but they were doing like big bombings of Gaza and things mm, like that yeah. that were that were for, for the time it was like, oh, this is all of a sudden, this is quite big and has come out of nowhere. But then obviously since then had escalated and became more regular. Uh, so I think after after the 2020 ones, I uh, was when I first signed up, I think, didn't hear anything back. Uh, and then the next time I signed up was in like December and then my action was in January 21. Uh, so by, by the time I was actually doing the action, uh, it was me and five others. We got up onto the roof of UAV engines, the, the factory I mentioned earlier, uh, where they actually produce the engines. Uh, you know, we got, got, got the building evacuated because if someone's on the roof, you've legally got to evacuate it. The roof isn't right. safe for people to be on. And you'd let me tell you, you could tell the roof wasn't <laughs> safe for people to be on. It was like big pools of water that dragged it down. Uh, wow. but you know, get up there, get, get everyone out, uh, did like a banner drop, you know, used some smoke grenades, got, was like, okay, everyone's out the building. We've got some good photos. Okay. Time to start smashing the shit out of the factory. Let's, <laughs> you know, let's make sure that this stays closed yeah. for as long as possible. Right. This isn't just going to be closed while I'm on this roof. This is going to be closed until you've repaired this to work in order. Right. Wow. You know, uh, so, um, we managed to pull the skylights off the roof uh, with hammers and crowbars. Uh, we got in through the roof to a couple of the workshops where they actually made the engines. Uh, we couldn't stay there very long because as soon as they knew we'd got in, they sent in you know dogs and police and stuff. So we, we nice. weren't actually in the building very long. Um, but you know, from the holes we'd made in the roof, we were able to like throw bricks at the engines and things like that and drop the ceiling by cutting cables and you know those sorts of things uh through smoke grenades in the building (laughs) yeah and then so you were arrested then yeah yeah so after about uh seven eight hours of uh you know doing what we could to make sure the building stayed closed uh the protest removal team got up on the roof and uh you know did a mix of negotiating people down and, and arresting them. Uh, yeah, eventually I ended up in the back of a police van, taken to Watland Street Station in the Midlands, which used to be like, I, I found out from watching some history show on, on, on not, not history show, not definitely not history show, like fake Viking show, that that used to be the border between like ancient England, like English countries, I think between Mercia. Right, and, well, it was a Roman and, road as well, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that was like a big historic thing. And, and, mm. and, and, and instead, and we're just like up against the brick wall getting like <laughs> our pictures took because the police are like, yeah, it's too busy in there. I'm just going to take your pictures here. Uh, and, you know, the first time, my, my arrest the first time was actually weird weirdly ideal in the i was the last one arrested uh i was the first one interviewed they forgot to fingerprint me uh and i basically mm-hmm. just napped for five hours and then got released uh nice. you know, I've, I've, wow. I've been arrested since then where it, it went much differently because the police lied and said that i broke bail to try and get me remanded so they could send me to prison uh do you find do you find um you know a difference of attitudes in the coppers themselves what's uh what's your interaction like with them so yeah in terms of interaction interpersonally there's definitely there's a couple of differences it's really just a scale of how aggressive are they willing to be at the time uh mm. you know you'll get some where as soon as they see you they're staring at you like they want to kill you and like right. you know that's like that's their immediate that's how they're presenting themselves there's other ones who act like they want to be your friend and like you know they, they really try and like be friendly with you so they can feel like they've accomplished something and they can get some information out of you uh, is that just good cop bad cop or do you think they are that's, no no i think i think there's a mix of like there's usually enough cops that you know they don't have to they can divvy it up as they like right. <laughs> you know, usually there's like 10 to 20 of them at least like per person like yeah. we get a lot we get a lot of cops out to an action yeah. uh even sometimes when we haven't done an action and they've just decided to arrest a protester outside a factory, you'll get like six, 12 cop cars pulling up for like one old lady in Leicester, you know, like yeah. they, they really want to do a show of force. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I've had a... Uh, well, <laughs> while my a, stolen bike goes 
on the track <laughs> down. <laughs> well, I mean, that's see, that's another part of the action that that, that is beautiful is we're giving petty thieves across uh, Birmingham <laughs> a chance to get out and do their crimes once they find out. <laughs> I think you we know. might differ on the philosophy behind that, but uh, <laughs> fair enough. You, you said earlier um, that technically those actions are legal. You you mentioned that in passing, and I don't I, I'm I don't understand how that's yeah. Possible. So if you're, if you're breaking property, not so ob- obviously the legal, but... obviously the actions are criminalized in terms of you know if you do it you'll be treated like a criminal you'll be taken to jail you'll if they, if they can charge you they'll charge you they'll try and send you to prison hmm. but uh, but at the end of the day all of those actions to pretty much whatever extent we've seen so far. They're all protected under British law. Uh, British law has, um, and international law, which is supersedes, should supersede British law. Absolutely. Uh, but like it, under under British law, you every single law, every charge that you can face for breaking the law, like the crime that you're accused of, will always end with without legal excuse. And there's various things that you can argue give you legal excuse. Uh, oh. One of those things is to prevent a greater crime or to prevent a greater loss of life. Uh, so, ob- so like, if that is enshrined in law, then like, how could it be possible that like breaking someone's private property, which is designed to go and illegally murder people, how is that not a, 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 a prevention of a greater crime? How wow. is that not a prevention of a greater loss yeah. of life? Like, because sometimes the judge tries to, I mean, because in the case of like Tony Greenstein and stuff, they tried mm-hmm. to get around that, didn't they, in some way to deny yeah, so, that argument? So, so basically, yeah. So basically, there there are a lot of different ways that you can argue that you've got legal excuse. Um, but after the appeal went through on the Colston Four trial, um, quick background for people who don't know about that. Uh, some people in Bristol tore down uh, the statue of Colston, who was an old slave trader from there, threw it in the docks. Uh, fuck you, old slaver. Mm-hmm. Uh, four of them got tried and got off with it. It was, you know, for legal the excuse juries reasons. Well, I mean, which is one of the heartwarming things, isn't it? The juries won't convict as well. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's another thing of like when thinking about strategy for actions is yeah. that uh, when it comes to cause and damage, if you can cause over five thousand pounds worth of damage, it should automatically go to crown court, which then means right. you've got a jury and you've actually got better chance of being found not guilty. Wow. So so really, the legal yeah. system encourages us to do as much damage <laughs> as possible. Wow. Um, but yeah, so. So after the, they they were found not guilty, it was appealed and it was found that they should basically not have been found not guilty, that they shouldn't have been able to make the legal excuse arguments. And it set a new precedent that uh, basically you don't get to make legal excuse arguments if enough damage has been caused. Uh, so since, they, since that decision came in, uh, which by the way is a decision that we know was a, was discussed in advance with uh, is, Israeli government officials from uh, yes. from official documents that have been yeah. released from the Eternal General's, o- General's Office. They talked yeah. strategically about how they would do that before that decision even came in. Yeah. Uh, that, that since that decision came in, they've used it to say we can't make legal excuse arguments. Uh, in some cases, they've even used it to say that activists can't speak at all in their case. Uh, and so they've literally taken away someone's right to be represented in court. Um, yeah, so we're in a... But also, I, I, with that being said, though, we have also have ca- had cases recently where the judges did allow legal excuse uh, to be made and they were, and the active actionists were found not guilty. So even though like these things are changing, but they're not set and they're still very nice. much in flux and we still, our legal strategy, if stuck to and like still fought with, can still get results despite the, the further legal crackdown. Does that mean in a way you believe in British justice or... Oh. Uh, oddly, I think uh, I believe in it more than the police do in the sense that, you know, I see them as the forces of injustice and I believe we'll defeat them. 
Right. Uh, but it's but, people talk about, you know, Russian interference in our fucking government. There's only one government that's been proved repeatedly to interfere in our democracy, and that's the Israeli government, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, even, you know, the even with the, this little fucking tripartite ag- arrangement we've got of, like, the US, the UK, and Israel, where, where you know, like, the two little best-running dogs of the US, <laughs> uh, even with this, like, relationship, the US still sees Israel as being their biggest foreign threat because they are because yes. <laughs> because at the end of the day they've got spies everywhere and they've got <laughs> spies within uh within government and what we've seen is that them having those spies doesn't stop us from taking action against them it doesn't stop us from being able to materially just end their operations in our communities like all we need to do is be persistent and be brave enough to face the consequences Yo, it's Talal here interrupting our inspiring and very interesting chat with AJ from Palestine Action. Thank you, AJ, for joining us this episode. And uh, I am only interrupting just to let you guys at home know that, yeah, we here are feeling the horrors and atrocities that are occurring in Palestine right now. And if you want to lend any financial aid to the people of Gaza, then... We just suggest to you that um, Medical Aid for Palestine is a great organization. The Alexel podcast always supports MAP. Go to map.org.uk and, of course, Palestine Action. Go to palestineaction.org to donate to them or even see how you can get involved yourself. There are actions happening all over the UK um, all the time. And... uh, (laughs) If you have any money left over and you want to help the show out, please go to patreon.com forward slash Alexi Sale podcast. Uh, you may notice that we never have any paid adverts on our show. And yes, I know we've got those fancy new Himaway bikes that we're using on the YouTube for our new series of bike rides, but we didn't get paid a penny for that. We just accepted a gift, um, which makes Alexi go faster. Anyway, <laughs> back to the podcast. So what, I mean, what, I mean, do you have a kind of overarching political, I mean, an overarching theory of, of what direct action means and where it, where it leads really? What's the? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, uh, Palestine Action itself as an organization, as such as that exists, like doesn't have any sort of like set ideology. Uh, you know, there is theory that is like taught in workshops and discussed and things like that, but it's, but, you know, there's. There's communists in Palestine action. There's a lot of anarchists in Palestine action. There's a lot of liberals. There's a lot of people who like aren't politically activated otherwise. Uh, there's even like some conservatives who just really care about Palestine. You yeah. know, like there's a, there's a mix of people who are committed to the wow. tactic. You know, whatever reason that is. Um, so I think that there's like a sort of unify and pluralistic potential behind direct action networks as a strategy uh in that sense are there any nutters who just love fucking shit up <laughs> i mean you know i'm not I, i'm not gonna speak to anyone uh okay. <laughs> we might have court cases coming up you know I, I wouldn't want to affect that for anyone uh but you know there's definitely you know any any group of people uh that you're meeting for political reasons or because you've all got a shared hobby or whatever reason that you're meeting them there's always someone you know you're like oh god they're you know they're a bit much but (laughs) but but like you've got them in the police you've got them in the army you've got (laughs) anything that gives them an excuse you know yeah but but typically i have found that uh i've never met anyone who joined palestine action because they wanted to cause shit or because they wanted to cause damage in general it's it's everyone who i've met in palestine action has joined because they cared so much about Mm. palestine and the palestinian cause and palestinian liberation and they just didn't see themselves as having an option but to act and you know for all the organizing that there is in the uk around palestine palestine action has got more results than anyone else and that's just the truth of it and because uh 
yeah, when it comes to direct action, you know, uh, there are principles that you can stick to about, you know, it has to be disruptive. You have to call, you have to uh, give them a dilemma. You know, yeah, ha- there's all sorts of principles that we stick to and that we teach. But really, you know, for me, like I'm a, I'm I'm a Marxist. Uh, for me, it's just like the action is the primary part of the practice, and like you have to develop the practice. You know, you you, you we have to like actually do it. <laughs> like you, yeah. you, you can't you yeah. can't just talk yeah. about how it needs to be done you yeah. can't wait for you can't wait for the government who isn't interested in getting it done to do it for you you have to organize to get it done and the best and most immediate way we can get it done is to do it ourselves is to just get out there and do it and yeah. and say go on then prove that that was a bad thing that i've done prove it i did no literally i dare you prove it in court you can't prove it you can't we keep getting found not guilty the only times that people have been found guilty is because you've put all these random loopholes on us or whatever or you've pressured them into into you know saying that they're guilty for whatever reason but at the end of the day we're not guilty albert systems is guilty israel is guilty the whole world can see it like we need to act we can't wait to be told that our actions are allowed yeah, well, it's um, just uh, nothing but admirable, I think, from yeah. my point of view. What, um, what's, <laughs> what's your uh, experience of the media being like? Uh, me personally, I've managed yeah. to avoid a lot of that. Really? You know, I've, I've, I've been, I've been interviewed with people and not seen the interviews used. So it's been like, oh, okay, I've been, the, you know, the journalist yeah. who came and spoke to me was nice enough. He seemed to be relatively on side his editor or whatever has decided none of what he spoke to me about should be included. We're just going right. to have the police stenography in there, you know, like, right. uh, yeah. but so like, you know, I, I've, I've mostly been erased it from the, in the, from the media perspective, which, you know, <laughs> is the kinder end of the stick really. Yeah, uh, right, yeah. Most of our coverage has been like local papers, you know, things like that or the morning star will run a thing about us. Right. Uh, but you know, most of the time we have been ignored by the larger media groups, which to me seems tactical considering like how much they talk about so many other protest groups, you know, like just stop oil or whatever. They'll love to make headlines talking about how much people hate them because <laughs> they know that it'll get it riled up. They'll get people riled yeah. up. But yeah. if, they, if they start actually printing about Palestine action with unless they've been able to find some way to frame us as terrorists right. or terrorist sympathizers or you know extremists in some way unless they found something they can latch onto for that they just don't talk about us at all because yeah. they know that the general public like supports Palestine or at least doesn't support the yes. Zionist genocide yes like, absolutely despite when you think despite all the you know, counter propaganda, all the anti Semitism accusations, the British public still supports Palestine. Did you see, imagine what it would be like if they got told the truth. Yeah. Exactly. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I mean, and, that's, and that's, that's another thing. Like, you know, I was talking about there's never any evidence substantiated of these Israeli claims. A lot of the claims that have been coming out of the past few days involving dead children and things, they've actually used pictures of the Palestinians that they're born. <laughs> yeah, they've uh, actually yeah. used pal- like pictures of Palestinian children in cages and then said that it's happening to Jewish children. Like, yeah. Yeah. They, it's so asymmetrical that they have to use, the, they have to repackage the suffering of the oppressed they're people trusted, to say, look yeah. what they're doing to us. And yeah. it, it's pure bollocks. It's pure bullshit. You know, like a, a, a friend of mine, uh, has uh, a saying that every accusation is a confession. And I think like with with this escalation this past week, I think that's, you can't see the truth of that just jumps out to me. There's been some really good uh, opportunities this last week for people to show their hypocrisy as well. Because in in America, there was, they were saying so much, I'm talking about like celebrities on social media and and people in the news saying that Israel has the right to defend themselves and all this blah, blah, blah. And then a few days later in America was National Indigenous Peoples Day. And then like everyone was doing their posts and their news reports about how indigenous people have been, uh, you know, betrayed and all the horrible things that happened in the genocide. And it's just such a highlight of, of hypocrisy there. And then you also had in the, the EU leaders talking 
about Israel's right to defend themselves and they have to fight back and all that. And then uh, a few days later, talking about uh, Russia's war crimes for cutting off water and electricity to Ukrainians. And it's just it's just so obvious and blatant mm. and surface level hypocrisy. It's, it's, and yeah. And, and, and again, think what, they're getting what, away with it. As well. Yeah, and once again, every accusation is a confession. When you know, yeah. when it comes yeah. to saying okay. Russia did that, like the US and Ukraine blew up the dam in mm. in Ukraine. They're the they melted yeah. down the, the, the nuclear. The they bombed pipeline. everything. Yeah. Like yeah. they're the ones doing it. They 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 flew in a bunch of imperialists from the states to sell off fracking rights to all the Ukrainian land to fundraise for the arm for like. They are the ones doing it. They're the ones ruining the land. They're the ones like committing these genocidal the acts. Snake eating. And, the, and they, they literally just say, "No, it's you. Actually, you're doing it." And that, that's yeah. the whole strategy. It's the whole strategy. It's pathetic. It's it, it's it would be more pathetic if it didn't work so much. <laughs> but you know, that's that's what happens when you've got like that level of media and that level of international collaboration like yeah. behind you is yeah. you don't need a good argument you just need it to be repeated enough yeah like, yeah I, the, yeah the, the, that's the law of false illusions isn't it partly it's a sort of you know where if you just repeat a lie often enough people start believing it really do you, what do you, do you see an end game do you see what do you see for the future really oh yeah i mean to me the end game is a free palestine and that's the only end game <laughs> And obviously, Correct. when you say that, people will go into like, oh, should we talk about one or two state solutions or whatever? That's that's not a question. It's a, it's a single state solution. It only yes, ever will be. It's yeah. a Palestinian state. Uh, the only way it wouldn't be a Palestinian state is if it was a greater Syrian state or pan-Arabic state that was like extended beyond the borders of Palestine. And Palestine was one area within that. But it would be a single a Palestinian state. It, I, it, it, like at the end of the day, people say if you if you say that, then you're calling for like the ethnic expulsion of Jews from the area. No, you're not. They, that's not actually saying that that that, that you're going to get rid of anyone. And what we've actually what you see anytime there is a, a decolonial struggle like this, and what we've already seen this past week is the when there's any sign of liberation, any indication that these colonial relations won't be allowed to be maintained, most of the settlers run. They don't want to be there anymore. They only want to be there as settlers. They only want to be there with like an apartheid class below them. They only, right. they don't they don't want to they don't want to live there because it's their home. They want to live there because they want to be benefiting from the system of apartheid that the settler colonial occupation provides. Yes. On that note, oh, well, that was amazing. Thank you very much. I think that um, you know, it's uh, I mean, even. V- it's a level of activism which is hidden from our eyes in many ways deliberately isn't Mm -hmm. it but it's a really you know i mean i think the world that you you live in i think seems to be you know from what you know i understand you know a a kind of really fertile world of 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 ideas and organizations and stuff like that which uh we you know which which in your case i think and certainly with palestine action takes a lot of personal courage and a lot of personal sacrifice um and it's you know a world that we should know a lot more about really so thank Quick you note. for oh go ahead yeah coming on yeah sorry. yeah go on i wanted to yeah. I, I wanted to ask you to, to tell our listeners where they can go to learn more about past and action how can they can support them i don't know if that's what you were about to do anyway oh no no okay so yeah i mean first of all like th- thank you for, for for that i i you know i just want to say like um to me it's the the only thing the only thing we can do is act you you act or you don't act and mm-hmm. inaction is a form of action mm-hmm. uh the level of risk and personal sacrifice that we put in doing this organizational work here in the uk it is not what well, sorry i don't like to say the uk here in britain uh not much better but you know uh <laughs> Great, I'm not great. gonna. I'm not gonna say it's non-existent. Obviously, there is sacrifice. Like there, there, there is dedication. That's what makes the work happen. But it is a fraction of what our Palestinian comrades on the ground in Palestine put in. And at the end of the day, this is one struggle. This is a war for a liberated Palestine. And 
we're just doing our best to support from our communities because at the end of the day the occupation forces in those war inflicting this terror constantly for over 70 years uh the nakhba has gone on for over 70 years like they 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 they're fighting from our communities already we need to we need we're in our communities we need to know how they're fighting and fight against them uh any amount of dedication any amount of sacrifice that we do will pale in comparison to the palestinian people mm. and the best thing we can do is join them in the struggle uh yeah if if you want to uh join palestine action or see more about what we do i think palestineaction.org is like got most of our information online there's a telegram channel there's a twitter uh account there's an instagram account i don't know what other social media we're on if yeah. any uh but yeah so we run regular workshops for people who want to get involved in actions and who want to know how best to they can do that uh Obviously, things are tense right now. We're seeing like such a backlash of repression and crackdown, not just against us specifically, but against any support for Palestine in the UK right now. Uh, if you are listening to this, I just want to tell you, do not let them put that fear into your heart. Do not let them stop you from acting. At the end of the day, it's the only thing we can do to make a change. If they're trying to scare you out of that, there is a reason. It's because they want to maintain the power relations as they exist. And we need to break them. We need to free Palestine and we need to do what we can to make sure that Palestine is free. I think they've put that fit in my heart, but I'm going to keep going. Yeah. Keep going anyway. Listen, <laughs> hey, if you want to... Alexi, we can get you up on a roof. I'm, I'm very confident. I can get you in the back of a van tomorrow if you want. Like, that can that's, happen. That's very kind. Thank you, but I think I've got a meeting at the BBC. I need to be oh, I see, I see, I see. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking true. Like, I went on the website and it said, you know, join us, but, uh, you know, be prepared to get arrested. And I, I froze. And I'm like, I, I, don't, I don't think I am prepared. Yeah, and, uh, and ob- obviously... Yeah, we get people on actions from all different contexts. We've had actionists in the 70s. Uh, you know, we've had Palestinian actionists themselves. Uh, we've had uh, uh, actionists from all different countries. We've had uh, Jewish Israeli dissidents on actions, uh, even. Um, but, you know, we also do know from practice that, like, the police being racist, the police being misogynistic, the police being Islamophobic, that's not something that exists in theory. That's something that exists in practice. And like when they come and arrest you, if you're Palestinian or Asian or Muslim, you will be treated yeah. worse than white actionists. If you're a woman, you will be treated worse than men. If you're trans, you'll be treated worse than cis people. Like I, uh, I like we've seen it happen. It does happen. Uh, so really that just means that the more privileged you are the more you have to get involved because you're going to be <laughs> treated point, more yeah. kindly i'm an elderly jewish white male wealthy white male so i should i should yeah i should be Go required on. to get involved more but th- there yeah, are also right. other ways there are also other ways to get involved you know like not to discourage anyone from doing the high level actions and, and that sort of hard work but there's day to day hard work you know there's like the social reproduction of it there's we have so many people whose main role is looking after people who get arrested and like that's how they help is they they try and make sure that they're outside the police stations waiting for them they buy them food they give them lifts you know like and they just make sure that they know that they're being taken care of and there's a community of people who care about their sacrifice and who want to help them be able to make those sacrifices fantastic well thank you very much thank you for everything and thank you for this podcast no problem. And, Thank uh, you. It's uh, lovely to speak to you. Yeah. <laughs> say something in Arabic. To, say something inspiring in Arabic. Hello. Ya AJ, شو بنعمل بدونك؟ شكرا جزيلا. نحنا معك وانتي معنا وكلنا مع بعض. يلا حرية. Inshallah. Thank you. There you go. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, no, I think it's a uh, you know it's a uh, a fascinating. I mean, you know, I mean, it's also that. You know, to be working class, I suppose we haven't really talked, I mean, I didn't really sort of touched on that, but I mean, I mean, you must have been on quite a journey in a way to come from your, from Netherly, <laughs> the way you are now in a way. Ev- I mean, crocky dogs. <laughs> oh, fucking hell. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've, you know, I've like, 
I've been speaking. To, I've I've spoke to like a girl from Warrington before about like, hey, do you want to come over? And she's like, yeah, right. Where do you live? Neverly. I'm not coming to fucking Neverly, you know. Like, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, but uh, no, yeah. I I obviously I grew up in a uh, single mom, uh, two kids. Uh, she. You know, she likes to say that we nearly became middle class, uh, basically because she got <laughs> she managed to like work up through childcare into uh, civil education. Like she was she she was setting up this program called Children's University for Nosley City Council. So like she likes to say that like she was like, oh, I was on like thirty grand a year. We were nearly middle class, and it's like, yeah, but you were still a single mom living on a on a <laughs> former council yeah. estate with two kids. Like, don't you hold your horses? You know, like yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you were you were working. Well, full time <laughs> but it's also it's, i mean the fucking apart from all the other pro, you know the the media discourse is still just so fucking middle class isn't it you know the, the, oh to say you it's, know. it's above middle class is the thing yeah I, like that that's that's the thing is like middle middle class can mean so many different things uh because it doesn't really exist like it, it obviously th- there's a much cleaner like caught between uh you know like proletarian and bourgeoisie than there is like a, a, a more layered st- uh, class strata which doesn't mean those classes aren't still there like when you when you're analyzing them in certain contexts you know like yeah. if you say to the average person on the street like oh are you middle class you know someone middle class they'll have an idea of what you mean of like oh they've got some money but you know they're not like to, but but really, yeah. what it means to be middle class can be can be so many different so things. That, that can be that can be like I'm a worker who gets paid well. It can be I'm a small business owner. It can be I'm a small business owner who's mm-hmm. making multi millions, and you know, uh, or like, and there's like so many different qualitative like class differences that all coexist within that one label of middle class. That like yeah. it can be it can be a bit. I feel like what's what's more important to me is like what's the class like direction you know that you're heading in and like what's the actual you know what's your what's your day what's your practice like yeah like what's your what's your consciousness like how are you putting it into place like yeah. what, what are your roots as well like did you work your way up to being middle class from working class roots because I'm sure yeah. there's far more of those than there are upper class people who used to be working class and now they're... yeah but also like look at look at nationality as well because like the uh, historic uh, the historic reasoning behind like how certain classes like arose in different countries is completely different uh, especially when you consider that like certain countries developed capitalism under imperialism they weren't able to develop through capitalism to reach imperialism they had imperialism find them from the outside and then like inject them with capitalism uh and so it was just like the way capitalism arises and those class categories form is just like a completely different context blimey what you doing what you do for fun (laughs) <laughs> uh so i was uh training to become a pro wrestler uh but, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but, obviously. obviously i got a few too many concussions though so really? I, I, I got a i got me third concussion in less than a year uh this spring and i've had like persistent concussion syndromes since then so i've not been able to train all year really fuck so uh, to hear that. No, it's, yeah. it's, it's okay you know it's it's one of those things where it's like you know kind of personally tragic of like oh no dream crushed and all that but at the same time like it frees up time and energy to like focus on other things like the struggle you know like well, you know we're, we're chinese mar- this is a chinese martial arts podcast so oh yeah you. same same so, yeah <laughs> <laughs> well I've, uh, you know i've i'm i'm still like sort of a beginner to uh chinese philosophy but i've uh I found through, I, f- I found through this podcast called Southpaw. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's a it's a left wing martial artists podcast. Oh really? Oh yeah, yeah. Should, should be in that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the the guy who runs that, Sam, is a friend of mine. He's uh, like Korean, living in America, uh, mm-hmm. and like he comes from like 
his, his parents were basically, he always says, we're a lot older than other people of his generation's parents. So nice. his parents grew up under Japanese imperialism and like saw it change hands into American imperialism. So he's got a lot of like direct historic knowledge from them. Uh, nice. but, also, but also, you know, a lot of like uh, Taoistic cultural influences. Uh, so like through his podcast and through speaking to him, I got exposed a lot more to Taoism. Um, and you know, I found it at a, I found Taoism at a time when I was particularly interested in philosophy because I was like developing my understanding of dialectical materialism. Uh, so then, you know, coming into like Taoist dialectics and like reading through the Tao Te Ching and, and, and the I Ching and things like that while like, intentionally trying to develop me understanding of dialectics it definitely made it like feel a lot more closer and easier for me to connect with i found uh obviously there's still a lot of really? you know, so, like, there was a, so you found i don't i know a lot but i know a fair amount about dialectical and historical materialism i don't really know much about taoism i know it gets mentioned mm. sometimes by our teacher it's a taoism precedes like uh shint uh, not shint it was the um zen no, the what's the uh, Shaolin? Is that I, am I getting everything? Oh, maybe? so uh, Shaolin would be a type of uh, kung fu, I think. Yeah, so but I, they're I, monks I, and stuff. It's a religious kind of. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it would be it. it would, Taoism uh, is like comes from a. Uh, I don't know if you would say ancient or pre-ancient, like tradition in china of like uh the Tao the, the jing which is like the foundational text was written during like the war and states period uh i think there's like multiple copies found of it from like you know three or four hundred bc uh but it but you know a lot like the ancient greek stuff uh it's very much assumed that it was adapted to a written form from an oral tradition right uh and the premise of the Tao the jing is the there was like this sagely ruler who was leaving society during the war and states period. He was like being like, no, I don't want to run this kingdom anymore. I'm going. Uh, and then like, as he was leaving the city and leaving civilization got asked by like the outer sentry guards, like you can't just go and leave us without all your wisdom, please like tell us how to, you know, how to rule the country or whatever. Right. So, so he like wrote the Tao Te Ching, like addressed at the ruler. So it's like basically saying like, if you're going to be in charge, this is how you need to do things. And, uh, and it's all about like doing as little as possible and as being as not involved as possible. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's, it's, it's very Ooh. much based in like, uh, an ancient Chinese culture and underst- cultural understanding. And of, how like, does that relate to dialectic and historical materialism? Oh well, well because it's it's sort of it's sort of also based in like dialectics in terms of uh, the things, you know yeah. you know like you know like the the yin yang symbol. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So that is essentially a diagram of dialectical philosophy. Nice. Uh, so like the uh... Uh, when it's just the circle and it's like split into two, that gets called taiji, uh, yeah. which which is where taiji comes from. Uh, yeah. Taiji taiji quan. Uh, that, though that sort of practice that branch of practices of martial arts and and meditation and things uh and that is basically like the unity from w- in which which is everything like the unity mm-hmm. in which everything is contained and is mm-hmm. uh and then like th- it subdivides into yin and yang uh yin and yang are opposite but mutually dependent mutually interpenetrating they contain each other you know it's a, all the dialectical principles is, is are essentially like the foundation of that entire cultural philosophy <laughs> uh, philo- philosophy not philosophy wow yes well i was not uh, expecting us to get here yeah but <laughs> that's, was, that's for another well yeah thank you for that as well that's uh, yeah no problem <laughs> always, always happy to talk communism and, and uh chinese philosophy and yeah. palestinian liberation you know <laughs> so yeah it's all one we should maybe speak with this south poor um, yeah, yeah and get yeah. you back on that episode too that's uh we've always talked about being the 
Chinese uh, martial arts podcast, but we've never actually done an episode dedicated to it. Chinese martial arts, Marxist podcast. Sam, who runs Southpaw, actually has a philosophy that he is developing uh, that he calls liberation martial arts. That's about using martial arts practice as a window into politics and philosophy and like... uh, you know the same 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 way as like is foundational to Taoism and is foundational to Marxism, using the praxis as the basis. I wonder if this is the you know I mean one of the things that I've you know particularly this week, but one of the things that you feel isn't it? I feel is that none of the old shit works, but somebody has got a have a new thing but the, the uh, thing is though a lot of the old shit did work and that's why they got rid of it <laughs> you know like right. there's there's a reason why so many black panthers ended up shot you know yes. like it's 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 because they were right and they were they were doing something that worked and they were onto something and and yeah the, the powers that be were fucking bricking it yeah, yeah. fair like, point yeah but we've still got to find a way then to still yeah, get. I mean, to win. we've always we've always got to adapt it to our current conditions, which yeah. involves the power asymmetry at the moment. But yeah. to me, the answer is like building dual power, which you know direct action doesn't necessarily do, but it is an important vehicle towards it in the sense that like. You can't build dual power and then ask the government that you're trying to separate yourself from to to do everything for you. You right. can't rec- you can't recognize them as your enemy, but then say to them, "Hey, you need to shut down those factories for us." Like they're not going to do that. They're your enemy. They want those factories open. That's why they're right. open. You need mm. to go and shut them down. Like uh, or but you know, if it was a food program, it would be a similar principle of like you know, if you would do if you were doing a, a community. Uh, survival program like a, a community food bank or or, or, food, or food club or whatever uh, with an it, with like with the specific interest of building dual power you wouldn't then go accepting like funds from the council to, to be no. running it because because that just undermines your entire like political yeah. ideology yeah. and practice and it changes yeah. what it is you're doing regardless mm-hmm. of what you say you're doing yeah, well, very. True. I mean, I don't know if I've talked about this before on the podcast, but I used to be like a patron of St. Mungo's because, which is homeless charity, because basically because they used to let the, the homeless keep their pets with them, you know. But then yeah, yeah. now St. Mungo's, the head and the head of engagement, both came directly from the Home Office. So they've mm. that organization that presented the challenge on homelessness to the government yeah, and has now also- been subverted by the government. There's there's all sorts of listen, you might not think of it for, from like that. looking at me, but I've I've been to Parliament multiple times <laughs> because you know, like I was when I, I was I've been homeless a few times. When I was homeless in Liverpool, I got a lot of help from uh the charity crisis. Like in ter- they put on a lot of education material. You know, there was a lot of stuff for me to do when I had nothing else to do. Uh but like through them, I also got onto something called Young Homeless Parliament, where they literally took us to Parliament and like <laughs> you know let us ask questions of some MPs, okay. and they they had the Tory housing minister come out and tell us like that we're all in this together, we hear your concerns and everything. Yeah. Uh, so then like I cornered them in the hallway afterwards, and was like, oh yeah, we're all in this together. Why are you committing genocide against disabled people then? You know, like what's how are we in it together? You know, yeah. like, and, at which point he, you know, but and but I was also taken there by this group called uh uprising uh who were like basically was a course for teaching activists uh and it was like activists and community organizers get into this we'll give you connections we'll teach you like effective ways of of organizing in your communities and stuff like that uh and of course when we uh found out earlier this year the or last year now at this point when we got the the leak of of like the members of the british atlantic po- uh, project which you know obviously has closed membership that they don't uh list anywhere a few of their members got leaked and it was found out that at least one of the people who joined uh joined because uprising this is the same group that was sending me to parliament and like trying to get me involved Pay, like paid for them to go to one of their private events and get them in the back door to this like project which is entirely a CIA cutout meant to right. like subvert British left politics well, right. uh, so that's how I ended up in parliament is because the CIA were trying to see if I'd be a good recruit basically <laughs> it's fucking, uh, uh, Bill Gates word. walked past me and everything it was weird really? <laughs> 
Uh, now we should return to this. Right, we're going to wrap this up for now. Thank you very much. I think we no problem. We got we got so much more to yeah. talk about though, really. So uh, hopefully we'll get you back on because uh, I'd love to check in. With feel you. like we're getting somewhere. Okay. Yeah, no problem. I'm happy happy we'd... to be back on any time. Yeah, um, yeah. I do have a trial starting on the sixth of November, so that could okay. interrupt things. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I'm not. Yeah. I'm always up for recording the podcast from my cell. You know, like yeah. <laughs> always. We can get you. We can get you my prisoner number. You can call up. We can have a little natter over the phone. Well, that'd not be dramatic. Talk, yeah, not talk out loud about how it's being recorded. You know. <laughs> well, you do have my number, so keep me posted how that all goes. Adrian, have a great trial, yep. dude. Will do. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> it's been fascinating. I mean, it's uh, you never know where these things are going to go, but it's been extraordinary. Yeah. Yeah, Thank I thought we'd have much. a good shot. Yeah. yeah. Well, we did. He did my. I thought we'd just be about you know keeping warm on a roof. Well, uh, I mean, I, I did get up there with like a tent and a and a, and a, a sleeping oh, so bag and everything. Just, yeah. I was planning to be there for a few days. They they did they, they did not. They weren't happy with us being yeah. up there. They were not going to let that go on for days. I think once we'd breached the roof, it was like, oh, we can't leave them up there unsupervised, sort of thing. Right. All right, cheers. Thanks a lot. We'll be in touch. Yeah, on that note. <laughs> yeah, I didn't bring my sleeping bag to this interview. So, yeah, we do have uh, to end at some point. Thank you so, so much. That's amazing. Absolutely amazing. You're not in Netherly at the moment, you there? No, no. I live over in Manchester at the minute. Well, I've, right. I've, I've got no fixed abode again at the minute, but, you know, I've got, I've got friends looking out for me. Okay, now. Cool. All right. Thank you. That's, a, that's been a, one of our most amazing podcasts. Thank you. Or will be. No worries. Cheers. So, what a fantastic uh, guest that was, and saying something really important. And um, since we recorded that episode of the podcast, uh, there has been the attack overnight on the hospital in Gaza, Baptist Hospital, um, and Israel has wheeled out its liar-in-chief, Mark Regev. Uh, I've been watching that man for 20-plus years lying on British television. The Israeli technique is always to, like with the murder of the Al Jazeera journalist Shirin Abu Akhla, the, the technique is to say, there was in stages, no, we didn't do it. No, we have proof we didn't do it. Oh, yeah, we were there. Oh, yeah, we did do it. By which time, of course, the uh, circus has moved on and um, Israel has effectively um, evaded responsibility, in this case, for the, uh, a journalist and I think probably in this case the uh, bombing of a hospital, even if this particular piece of munitions wasn't uh, Israeli, we know that the vast majority of people have been killed by Israeli rockets and bombs. And I think the work of AJ is particularly significant because those rockets and bombs that were killing people contain will all contain uh, bits of um, technology manufactured by Elbit Systems, and some of that technology will be will have been made in Britain. Hmm. Uh, just, just this morning, less than 12 hours after the um, the bombing of the hospital, uh, Palestine Action actually shut down the Elbit factory in Leicester. I was just looking at it now. The, that happened this morning. They, they did an, another big action and um, forced evacuation and, and uh, smashing up the uh, car park and stuff. So... I don't know how Good. long that will be shut for, but it does have a direct effect. That's, like, yes, it's because something. they won't be exporting any parts today, at least. One of the things Israel. you know about this com- conflict sorry, is that we we all feel so helpless, and at least uh, Palestine Action is uh, doing something, mm. something important and noble. I think it was just it is striking to hear how. Um, you know, we we have so many people on the on the left, and and uh, talk. We all we do is fucking talk. <laughs> yes. 
and whether you agree with their methods or not, like they actually do, which is, yeah. which is, uh, yeah, it highlights the <laughs> the futility well, of what what most of us get on with on the left. Well, I, I have, I, I did check with Linda, and I have been already sending them money. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I will be sending them uh, more money on a sort of sidebar. I think. I think one thing that I've been thinking is that no Muslim in Britain should vote Labour in any upcoming elections. Vote for, look for Rahman's Aspire Party, vote for George Galloway's Workers' Party, vote for the Greens, vote for the Monster Raven Looney Party. But no Muslim, I believe, should ever vote Labour ever again, given their pusillanimous um, behaviour over this crisis. Just Muslims? Well, most, I mean, first, well, nobody, I mean, nobody should vote. I think everybody should uh, think hard about voting for the Labour Party. Yeah. But I'm just saying that, you know, I don't know. I, I was, I was still wondering what to do in the next election, but I think the last couple of weeks have put a fine line under that. I mean, David uh, Lammy, for instance, is a sickening, spineless individual. Emily Thornberry. Oh. And the leader of, you know, the jellyfish in chief, Keir Starmer. <laughs> uh, That's a new one. <laughs> yeah. Oh, shout out to previous guest Basim Youssef. I don't know if yeah, you've seen this. God, Did you yeah. see his interview yesterday? Yeah, I watched it live on there, Piers Morgan, on Talk TV. Yeah. He went on Piers Morgan's show again yeah. and uh, for 45 minutes just made a twat out of him. It was, um, yeah. And the, I think the first 10 minutes of the interview were how do you make comedy out of this? And like, he showed how like his posturing and like the way he was being so ironic and you couldn't, you have to watch it, at least watch yeah. the first 10 minutes yeah. of this interview. Yeah. The way he fucking, yeah. I mean, uh, fair play to Piers Morgan for having him on, you know Absolutely. I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, he's a kid, but he's a funny, he's a funny character, Piers Morgan. He can oscillate between being awful and, and almost, you know, you have respect for him in a way. He's, that, he's, that's on YouTube awesome. in full. So do go yeah. out and, and, and give it a look. It's it's yeah. really funny. And also people should listen to our our podcast with Basim Yusuf, which we did, what, last yeah. year, was it? People should really no, tune into that. This, was it this year? Yeah, it was uh, when I supported him on his tour in the yeah. UK bit. So tune into that as well. Get back get back into our archive and listen to Basim Yusuf on, uh, on, yeah, fuck YouTube, but get him... Listen to our podcast. <laughs> but no, do go watch his interview. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do that with, as well. Piers, the new one, because there's yeah. a sec, there's a there's two he's done, but don't watch the old one. The new one is great. Yeah, um, yeah, um, yeah. It's just horrific the events overnight, and it's 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 just it's getting to be enough. Really, I I can't. Yeah, I can't stand it anymore. I can't imagine what it feels like to be trapped in Gaza right now. No, it's, uh, it's, I imagine they, uh, there's another demo on Saturday, and um, I, I imagine yep. that will be massive. Yep, and there's a vigil tonight. We're recording this on Wednesday. This outro um, vigil tonight for the victims in the hospital in London. Oh yeah, where's that? Oh, don't ask me. What Let me tell me. I don't know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. I just saw that it's occurring. Okay. Um, but yeah, fucking, yeah. And Biden just landed in Tel Aviv. And don't be old twat. he has doubled down saying it definitely wasn't an Israeli rocket. Yeah, um, like he'd, he'd seen the photos of the beheaded children. Yeah. There's a video of that rocket striking the hospital and it doesn't sound like a cheap Hamas thing. It, it no. sounds, it's got an American accent, the rocket. Yeah. You can hear yeah. it when it like, Well, <laughs> I mean, I'm speculating it. I don't fucking know for sure. No, but, but Jeremy Bowen, one of the, um, you know, one of the, the BBC's guy on the ground who occasionally can be all right, um, just said, you know, Ham, uh, Islamic Jihad, Hamas do not have rockets with that kind of power. Yeah. And I believe that that's true. Yeah. 
I can have the mark right here. Jesus, that is the face of pure evil. Is that the guy with the Aussie accent? Yeah, Mark oh from Melbourne. God. Yeah, his interview yesterday. Fuck me, that was. Yeah, he he was like quivering with fake anger in it. Yeah, his ears were flapping around, and it was one of the ugliest people I've ever seen. He is one of the George Orwell. I mean, you do. I mean, it is George Orwell said, you know, by forty, everybody gets the face they deserve, and that man. <laughs> Um, the, the, yeah, like you say, he has got a face which is the face of pure evil. He is horrendous, just um, like you, you know, like a kind of CGI monster. The shit he was spouting was yeah. was tr- tremendously evil. It was just ju- yeah. he was justifying the death of children. And yeah, I remember we've seen him once on Newsnight with Jeremy Paxman saying that. Effectively, I think this must be in 2014, the 500 children they'd killed had, in effect, killed themselves. Oh, God. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, the man is... Uh, the man is also <sighs> lacking in principles and, you know, just... I mean, it's I don't know, un-fucking believable that that... And, and being treated with great... Um, there's a... Um, it actually, it, one of the things that was interesting about um, the the attack on the hospital was the Palestinian people who spoke for the Palestinian cause last night were being treated much more politely. There was a complete change in tone that they, they weren't being interrupted. The interviewers didn't have that sort of tone in their voice, which was when they're high up in the chest yeah. and accusatory, the kind of K. Burley um, interview style, and. Um, being treated much more respectfully for once. But still, the, there's a guy, it was a News 24 journalist called, I think, Christian Fletcher, who was, you know, calling Regev Mark and uh, was treating him as if he was an old mate. If you are old mates with the devil, what does that make you? An imp. <laughs> It was a rhetorical question. I know. I, I, I won't <laughs> leave that in. Um. Anywho, so I, I, I recommend this podcast is extraordinary, I think. and uh, it, it's, uh, <laughs> it is. An amazing individual to get on to happier times. So we're going to start drip feeding our, our exclusive what's coming up in the, in the near future. We spoke to Peter Capaldi. We spoke to... Doctor Fucking Who. Our longest interview today. Yeah, two-hour interview with Doctor. Two Fuck. and a half hours. Yeah. So we might we're gonna split that up over two yeah. episodes. Yeah. And I've I filmed it all. So we're gonna yeah uh, keep an eye out on our social media. Yeah. Alexis Sale Pod on Instagram. Uh, Alexis Sale Pod on on Twitter. Um, X. Um, and uh, we'll put little video clips, tease that shit. But um, we were going to put it out this week, but after what's yeah, been happening events, in the news. Uh, I think we may have another Palestine-related podcast before then as well. Yes. So we, we're but it will only build your anticipation. Yes. Watch out. The Doctor is coming. Yeah, and I think yeah. we get into it with Peter Crowley more than any interview has ever done. We, we basically explore his whole life story, and it's fucking fascinating. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's really, yep, really yep, cool. Yep, yep, Very yep. funny, and he's charming, and he was a delight. Such a nice man. Yeah. So that is coming soon, people. If if we remain on air, and uh, <laughs> our our bike rides are back. Yeah. Go to Alexis Sale official on YouTube and check out the new bike ride. And yeah. there's more to come. Yeah, and they uh, seem to be doing whether well. the, the the viewing figures are building. Do you want to know the tagline I've been using? No, go on. <laughs> New bike, new camera, same old Alexi. <laughs> so the older Alexi. So fucking cheesy, but um, <laughs> that, that's all true. We got a new electric bike, new fucking beautiful 360 camera. Yeah. Um, there's a really nice shot when you cross over Blackfriars br- Bridge, and I mm. do 360 pan a- around the whole scene, and I just really like that. Um, uh, I'm looking forward to the next one. To infinity and beyond is the next one. No, to infinity dental care. Dental and care beyond. and beyond. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. right. I think we've done our due diligence. Yeah. Um, thank you again to AJ. Yeah. Go to PalestineAction.org yeah. to find out how you can get involved or how to support them. Um, write to MPs. Fucking 
do your bit on social media. But what I've been telling a lot of my friends who have been getting lost in a hole of social media and news and like, you know, getting really fucking depressed, make sure you're mm. looking after yourself as well out there. Go out for yeah. a walk. Um, don't forget to see your friends and, and you know, yeah, um, look after yourselves too, please. Um, okay. Right. Free Palestine. Hurriya lal Palestine. Yeah, indeed. Bye bye. You've been listening to the Alexi Cell podcast. This show is produced and edited by Talal Karkuti. Music by Tarbush Records. Thanks to Audio Boom for hosting us. Please keep your emails coming in at alexisellpodcast at gmail.com. Goodbye.